All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to start with the with our uh, afternoon panel discussion. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to thank Amy Wax of Penn Law and her husband for making the trek out here to be with us today. That's quite a. Uh, I, I assume you're back in your semester this fall. Yes. Uh, I, first and foremost, I just want to touch on. Uh, the, the whole concept of academic freedom, which I know has been near and dear to your heart. Uh, for those of us who are not in academia, first, as a, as a contractual or legal matter for these academics, what, what does tenure really mean? Well, that's a very good question, and it's actually uh, at the heart of the case that Penn is now pursuing against me. And when people ask me that question, and they do ask it, I say, there's good news and there's bad news, right? Especially if you're trying to invoke the protections of tenure as I am, right? There is very little experience with efforts to strip people of tenure because up until now, uh, the academic world has treated tenure respectfully uh, and with kid gloves and that has been something that people across the political spectrum have agreed on, in part because I think lefties know that it protects them as much as it protects people on the right. So there haven't been many opportunities to really fill in the blanks, like what does tenure mean? That's the good news and the bad news. If you're someone who's trying to invoke tenure, the good news is it's an open question and you can try and give it content. The bad news is it's an open question. So you don't really know what your protections are. You don't know what it means. Um, I am a professor at a private university. So that means I am not protected by the First Amendment of the US Constitution. Little known fact in our ignorant polity is that the First Amendment does not apply to private institutions. It says Congress shall make no law. It is the government that has to respect your free speech rights. If I was a professor at a public university, then I would have the benefits of the First Amendment. I'm a professor at a private university. I don't. What I do have is a contract, and that is my tenure contract. What does that contract protect? We're going to find out. Do you think if you were earlier in your career, perhaps not as established, perhaps not as, as financially settled, uh, that you would have been able to uh, embark on this fight? Well, I probably not. And, and this is interesting because there have been other people conservatives, uh, professors on the right, who have been, attempts have been made to cancel them uh, and otherwise sort of run them out of town on a rail. Uh, there's a guy at Georgetown named Ilya Shapiro. He, he was supposed to be at Georgetown. He ended up never assuming his position. He's, you know, a good 30 years younger than I am. And although I am disappointed that more people don't stand up and fight, I really can't fault these younger academics who are at the beginning of their career, most of whom don't have tenure protection, who don't have my degree of financial security, who have young children and they're trying to get established. I cannot fault these people for just giving up and quitting the field. And I can't say that I would do it differently. But when people say to me, why are you fighting this fight? You're 70 years old, you're coming to the end of your career. Uh, why don't you just retire and enjoy life and your grandchildren and all of that? I say, no, no, I am in the very best position possible to stay the course and oppose what is happening to me and fight with every ounce of my strength I am the very person who should be fighting. I have all the advantages uh, that are required. So I am the last person to call it quits. And, and let me just add 
that, you know, being a rather judgmental person, well, of course, that's part of my traditionalism, uh, not that lefties aren't judgmental, oh my gosh, they certainly are, just about different things, right? I do judge my fellow senior tenured professors negatively because I am disappointed that all the support, virtually all the support that I have received has been private and behind the scenes. You know, I really sympathize with what you're doing. I support you. Good for you. What they're doing to you is outrageous. It's not good for education. It's not good for the students. It's not good for the coming generations and all of that. But when I ask them to sort of stand up and publicly, you know, give their opinions or develop petitions or whatever the people on the left do, they can't be bothered. And I just considered that egregiously selfish. I really do. I teach Edmund Burke in my course on conservative thought. And Edmund Burke has this wonderfully articulated concept of the covenant, which, you know, as a Jew, I translated into the bris. What is the covenant? What is the bris? It is the tie that binds past generations to present generations to future generations. It is an obligation of reverence and gratitude to past generations that have conferred upon us all of these wonderful gifts, including universities, our, our glorious universities in Western society and in particular in the United States. And that gift entails an obligation to preserve, protect, and defend those institutions for the benefit of coming generations of our posterity, right? Us and our posterity. And I just don't see the recognition of that obligation among my fellow academics. It is really virtually absent. I gave a talk at Stanford University not long ago and about this very topic of academic freedom and I talked about how uh, I have one son and two daughters. My two daughters went to uh, Philip Sandover, which is a very exclusive and expensive private school that, like all the rest of them, has gone totally woke. But the one good thing about Andover, I thought, was its motto, non sibi What does that mean? Not for ourselves. We are not doing this for ourselves. It's not all about us. It's not all about me, like my having a pleasant life and riding off into the sunset. It's about those who are gonna come after us. That's who we're doing it for. That's who we ought to be doing it for. And I just see kind of empty space there where non sibi should, should be. I'm curious in the crowd, uh, how many people were already familiar with Professor Wax and her travails at Penn Law before today? Okay, so it looks like a good number of you. Isn't this the whole point of tenure? The fact that you can explore truth wherever it takes you, say what you want to say, write what you want to write? Well, I would think so, right? But the people who now control the universities the sort of cultural Marxists, the wokeistas and the lefties, they have a whole new conception of what tenure does, protects, and is for. And they use the tricks, the verbal tricks and ticks that you were talking about earlier to accomplish their purpose. So here is the argument that is used against me. Even though everything that they are objecting to about me and seeking to penalize is, has to do with things I've said. That's called speech. They have repackaged it and relabeled it as behavior. Behavior that is contrary to the mission and values of the university as currently defined, diversity, inclusion, and equity. You'll notice that seeking the truth is not on the list, okay? And they have reconfigured the harm principle, our famous million liberal harm principle, into a kind of 
psychological bugaboo that if you upset special and minority students especially and make them feel hurt and unsafe and offended, then essentially tenure doesn't protect that. Tenure doesn't protect professors from being penalized and punished for harming students. Notice all the little tricks and transformations that go into that. Well, of course speech is behavior, but duh, it's a special protected kind of behavior. Traditionally, that is what academic freedom of expression has always meant. That is studiously ignored, right? Heckler's veto, it's a fundamental principle of First Amendment law and free expression. The fact that you're here, or the, those who are hearing the speaker are upset or offended can't be used to shut down speech. That's the end of academic freedom. Well, they've never heard of the heckler's veto. The heckler's veto is gone. So through these kind of subtle transformations, according to you know, the woke catechism, they are gradually wiping out the core of academic freedom that tenure protects. And it is deliberate. This is a program that they have deliberately embarked upon, and what is the goal? The goal is to purge the academy of everyone who is even remotely right of center. Right? They control the academy. They want to make that control complete. They want to turn it into a monoculture and a monolith, and the few people left like me are cuckoos in the nest and have to be ejected. It all, it all sounds very Soviet. I mean, I'm, I'm friends with Michael Rechtenwald, who was canceled at NYU under similar circumstances. I've, I've heard you describe academia as a, a Western, or maybe even a masculine environment in the sense that there's supposed to be academic rigor, there's supposed to be objectivity, there's supposed to be criticism, there's supposed to be robust debate and speech, and that these are uh, attributes or traits which perhaps a lot of folks on the progressive left view as outdated or outmoded? Well, I mean, there's two ways of looking at all of those qualities or values, shall we say, you know, rigor, objectivity, um, truth-seeking, uh, discourse and debate. Uh, one can see them as sort of universal values or goals or practices and I think that is the right way to see them. But as a practical matter on the ground, if we're going to be social realists about it, uh, men are much more likely to embrace those practices than women, just empirically that is so. Now, we could speculate all day about why that is. You know, everybody has their own little theory. And a lot of it is grounded in Stereotypes, stereotypes have gotten a bad name, but as Lee Jussum, this psychologist at Rutgers, has pointed out many times, many stereotypes are valid. <laughs> they're, they're stereotypes for a reason, they describe reality. And we're of course not talking about every single person, not every single woman leads with her emotions, right, and avoids conflict and doesn't like, you know, uh, down in the mud wrestling, uh, rigorous debate. Uh, but there are more women who are put off by that than men, right? And that's a fact. So the feminization of the academy, which looked fair and just and like it might be a good thing, I think has been uh, pretty much on balance a disaster. It has really been a disaster for academia. and. Partly, I blame the victim. I blame men for this. Uh, in my ideal scenario, we would have seen positions in academia opened to everyone who can meet the standards. We would have seen really uh, a real sense of equal opportunity, right? Because uh, that is a, a very strong liberal value. But for the people coming in, the, you know, the old guard and the men should have said, look, 
we're happy to hire women or minorities or whoever, but we will protect and preserve and defend the standards of academic rigor and you know truth seeking and candor that uh, we have worked for many hundreds of years to generate. And we're not going to give that up. We are not going to give in to the values of the nursery and the kindergarten of making everybody feel good, which is really, I think, the, where the, the feminine presence in academia has taken us. So I think that men should have been much uh, more strict and uh, frank and demanding uh, about the changes that were being not just requested, but insisted upon uh, by women. Now that we're here, you know, you have to abandon the quote unquote masculine values that defined uh, fine academic institutions and come over to our side, right? That should never have happened. Well, in particular with law in the US, we have an adversarial system. We have common law precedents. Uh, we, what is the average law student today? Does the average student come to, I, I won't ask you to speak to Penn, but in general, do you think law students today um, come to law school with uh, already incubated and woke? Oh, totally. Well, I mean, I think that the, the woke direction of education generally, and of course it starts in kindergarten, as I suggested earlier, and goes all the way through at this point, has been disastrous for legal education. The feminization of higher ed and lower ed has been disastrous for uh, legal education. And that's because we still have, and heaven knows how long we'll be able to hold on to it, right? It's, it's uh, an endangered species at this point. Uh, we still have an adversary system in our country, in the United States, uh, and that means that uh, lawyers, well-trained lawyers, have to learn to present arguments uh, for either side of a particular question or dispute. They have to learn how to best represent their client, or as one of my mentors in the Justice Department once said, to say what justly can be said on behalf of your client's position. That is your obligation. And in order to do that, you can't insist that you agree with your client's position, You know that your client's position represent the social justice position, the woke position, the progressive position, because that won't always be the case. Of course, the whole idea behind the adversary system is that by having attorneys on both sides of a question go at it, in a zealous way to the best of their ability, then the right answer under the law, the truth, the evidentiary truth, and the legally correct uh, position will emerge from that refiner's fire of the adversary system. So getting back to our law students, there is a significant contingent of law students now who do not want to hear even here, let alone master or understand, I mean, we don't even get to that point, uh, any views or any ideas or legal arguments that they consider uh, unjust or unfair or inconsistent with the progressive catechism. Uh, the situation is really like, this is sort of a story from my family, my son, when he went off to college, he would come home and his two sisters would say, Isaac, what's college like? What, you know, what's it like? And here's what he would say. I'm gonna have to put down my microphone. He'd say, there are a bunch of girls mostly, but all types of people. And this is what you hear from them. Isaac, don't say that, don't say that. No, you can't say that, Isaac, don't say that, don't say that. And of course, this would, you know, his sisters would just dissolve in peals of laughter. Uh, he could reliably get them to, you know, laugh out loud when he would do a little, don't say that, Isaac, don't say that. 
And that's essentially what we have at Penn Law School today. Don't say that. And the students will complain to me, because they kind of trust me not to out them. Um, they will say, the classes are now a kind of gray dead zone. Some of the professors try to get discussions going. It, it never happens. Because if you say anything that deviates from you know, the woke position, there will always be a few people in the class who will you know, rear up indignantly and say, that's offensive, or that's racist, or that's sexist, or all the you know, xenophobic, or all the ist words, white supremacist is sort of the favorite now. And everything comes to a screeching halt. And why should anybody stick their neck out and risk getting into trouble by engaging in a class discussion or debate? I mean, they know better than to do that. So how can you learn to function in an adversary system if you never kind of get past the orthodoxy? I, I don't think anybody is really taking that question seriously enough. Okay, but fast forward 10 years, 20 years, you've got these students now. I mean, we've all heard the term results-oriented judges, but what happens when we have top to bottom, every, everybody under 40 politicized judges, maybe even justices, politicized prosecutors, politicized public defenders? I mean, at, at what point do, let's, Americans in our case, but Canadians, at what point do people start to feel that the quote-unquote rule of law shifting under their feet and everything just becomes about results? And so just like we, you know, free speech is just another value among many to be considered to get to our result, our progressive result. Uh, I fear that lawfare will become the same thing. Yeah, well, it's already happening. It is definitely already happening. And, you know, I sometimes say that there is now a serious contingent of people in the legal profession who think that free speech is this fetish that white people have that they really need to get over. I mean, that is, that is the attitude. And that is extremely dangerous. I think it is very frightening. You know, this wonderful system that we have built, and it has taken uh, many hundreds of years and struggle and reverses and sacrifice to enshrine the rule of law uh, and this honest, rigorous system. Um, and I can just see it dissolving before my very eyes. Uh, and, you know, once again, I'll say something very partisan. The Democratic Party, uh, this is one of the, you know, planks in their platform. This is really what they seek to do. The prosecutors that they are appointing, the judges that they are appointing, the justices that they are appointing, they are engaged in this project of dismantling the fundamental components of the rule of law. And if you doubt that, okay, all you have to do is, you know, look at some of the decisions that are coming out of the courts, uh, which many people are not aware of. But those of us who follow uh, judicial decision making can point to some pretty shocking and egregiously uh, results oriented and incredibly poorly reasoned decisions that are just so obviously partisan and oblivious to uh, the limits that are ordinarily recognized that uh, it's deeply disturbing. I'll actually. There are many examples I could give, but one example is the recent Harvard Affirmative Action case. And here I am referring to the two lengthy dissenting opinions, one written by Justice Sotomayor, one written by Justice Jackson, a newly appointed justice. And they're all as smooth as sugar, both of them are, uh, in very fancy, lofty language, but they, completely ignore uh, decades of affirmative action precedent uh, and are legally dishonest and shoddy in the most fundamental way. Uh, and I just find that very disturbing. Those are the two most 
liberal justices uh, and their opinions are uh, a disgrace in my, in my humble opinion. Um, so I could elaborate more on the details, but uh, I think any honest broker who reads the multiple decisions in that case, and there are 257 pages of them, so it is uh, quite an undertaking to study that decision and all the various opinions in it, uh, cannot help but come to that conclusion if they are honest and objective. Do any of your students make you hopeful? Oh, absolutely. Um, although I have been the target of an unrelenting campaign of, uh, I don't know, prosecution, persecution, name calling uh, by my dean, now former dean, he's just stepped down and we have a new dean who's probably no better, um, and have received incredibly negative publicity um, I continue to teach until Penn issues a final decision in my case, which I think is coming soon. And this year, I'm teaching a year-long seminar in conservative political and legal thought. I'm also teaching another seminar in um, neuroscience, law, and responsibility. And I have 10 students enrolled in my uh, conservatism seminar. Uh, and these are a brave and hardy band because... I know that they, excuse my profanity, get tons of shit from their fellow students. Like, why are you taking this course? Why are you having anything to do with this racist professor? You know, what do you think you're doing? And I think for a law student to have to defend themselves uh, from their fellow students, these comments, that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and yet, they persist and you know, are gonna take this course. Uh, these students are unique. They're, uh, they're definitely countercultural. They're not all on the right. They're not all conservatives. Some of them are self-identified lefties. But they all share one thing, which is they're kind of fed up with the propaganda that they've been peddled from day one, and they know that it does not represent a quality education. They know they've been cheated. And in many cases, they've gone to the best schools. So, you know, we're talking about fancy private schools, uh, fancy colleges, name recognition for these fancy colleges. They've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on their education. And they come out of it feeling cheated, right? And they're not all white either. I mean, I have you know se had several Asians in my classes. I've had students contact me in the university, black students. I had one write me just a couple of days ago, uh, who I had coffee with last year, uh, a freshman from Philadelphia, black guy, and. You know, he said to me, I want you to teach me about conservatism because I don't know a thing about it. And, and that's true. They don't know a thing about it. I mean, some of them have never heard of Frederick Hayek, not just never read him, I right? never heard of him. Okay? They've never heard of lesser known lights like Michael Oakeshott, James Burnham, Richard Weaver, they never, Bertrand de Juvenal, these, these people are not on the syllabus. They're not in the curriculum. There's a whole half of Western thought that is just absent from their prior education. And they're smart enough to know it. And they're curious enough to want to find out what's in those books, even though ultimately they might reject it. Yeah, do we have time for one more? So I want to ask, at what point do we say, look, the IVs are over. The, these universities are so bad that we, especially as parents, I have teenagers, that we need to sort of withdraw our sanction, stop granting them so much status, and recognize them for what they are. 
Well, that is one heck of a tough sell for a number of reasons, although I will offer you a glimmer of hope at the end of this little disquisition. Uh, and I think there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, you know, the Ivies and the prestigious colleges generally, the selective colleges, right, and we all know what they are in the United States, they are the gateway to the upper middle class, right? They are the gatekeepers to high earnings and the good life. And every upper middle class parent certainly, and some middle class parents as well, they want that for their kids. And as long as little Caitlin gets into Princeton and gets out of Princeton, they really could give a damn what little Caitlin is learning at Princeton, okay? So, you know, the notion that that most people are intellectual or have intellectual values or even have a love of truth is really a canard. Um, I, I forget, uh, John Darbyshire quoted this to me. Some, uh, some intellectual said, the love of truth is the faintest of human passions. <laughs> and I really think that's accurate, right? So, you know, little Caitlin will come home from Princeton and say to her father, uh, do you know that you are a heteropatriarchal uh, oppressor and persecutor and that you should, you know, be run out of town on a rail? And please sign the check for my next semester at Princeton. And of course he will, right? The other factor is these institutions are kept afloat by tons of government money, but also by donor money. And frankly, a lot of the donors, not all of them, because some of them have this irrational attachment to their alma maters, a lot of the donors are motivated by the thought that if they give money, right, and show that they're loyal alumni, their granddaughter, little Caitlin, will get in. Now, that's a very powerful incentive to support your alma mater. Now, here's the fly in the ointment, okay? With the abolition of racial affirmative action, there is now a war on legacy admissions for these colleges and universities. The Biden administration has launched an investigation into the racially differential effects of legacy admissions. If these schools decide to abolish the advantage for legacy children, that is the children of people who have attended the university in the past, and as a corollary, the advantage for big donors to the universities, and they tend to overlap, right? Then that motive to support the Ivies will be much reduced. It might even go away. So in a way, you know, these progressive do-gooders that control the university are kind of shooting themselves in the foot. Now that's why I predict that the legacy advantages will survive because they are essential to uh, these schools' power. And they have enormous amounts of power, these schools, because of, of those two factors, mainly the advantages that they presumably confer on their graduates. Uh, and until that goes away, I don't really see the Ivies losing um, their influence, you know, and the veil being torn away and saying, you know, this is really just a crock. I think we've known for a very long time that what people actually learn at these places is dubious at best and affirmatively harmful at worst. Okay, Amy Wax, thank you so much for coming.